Good afternoon. My name is Francis Guy. I'm CEO of Scotland's International Development Alliance, and I'm very pleased to welcome everyone to this key event, which the Alliance is pleased to host, exploring some of the key social justice issues facing the international development sector. A sector, let's be honest, that is defined by the historical legacies of colonial rule and all that means in terms of power dynamics and potential for racist and paternalistic attitudes. We were able to explore some of these dilemmas in our annual conference in December in a session called Tackling the Talk. That session got the highest positive feedback of any session at our conference from participants and it also got the highest demand for follow-up. So we're very pleased today to be able to hold this event with an amazing panel so that we can commit to having that follow-up discussion. I'm pleased to welcome members and non-members of the Alliance to this event. We were keen to encourage as wide a participation as possible, but for those of you who are not members, may I also encourage you to join us so that we can continue to explore these issues together. Can I also ask all attendees to adhere to the Alliance Safe Spaces policy and treat everyone here today with respect. The Safe Spaces policy is linked in the chat so that you can see it. The second part of the session, which will start just after three o'clock, will take place on a second separate Zoom link, which will also be shared in the chat and which has been sent to you by email and will be resent to you by email. After entering that separate call, you will be introduced to the facilitators of the breakout groups and then be transferred to your breakout group. I hope that's clear, but if you have any questions, please do put them in the chat. And if you have any questions for the panelists, please do use the Q&A function during the first panel session. And I know that our chair will be very happy to take some of those questions on board. It's my great pleasure to introduce you to the chair of the panel, Lina Biro. Lina is an anti-racism activist, organizer and curator of events across international development. She is the engagement and equity manager at Bond, a committee member of Charity So White and a core group member of the Racial Equity Index. And she's been very helpful to us in exploring these issues. Thank you very much, Lina, over to you. Thanks very much, Francis, for that warm welcome. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this great session uh, by the Alliance, Understanding Practical Steps to Shifting Power, Active Anti-Racism and Decolonization. Um, this is gonna. This session, as Francis said, is going to be twofold. The first hour will be a panel discussion with some incredible speakers that I will introduce shortly, and then we'll move into uh, breakout sessions to really think about um, how we connect action to those bigger issues that we are going to be talking about. As I was thinking about this session, um, I thought about the last two years that have happened. Um, the, it's been two years since the horrific murder of George Floyd, the stunned silence um, from our sector, from global society, the moving through the summer of solidarity statements. And I was wondering what really has changed and what have we learned? I think some of those answers will come as we move through this session uh, and through the discussions and hear from the different speakers. I've been thinking about the bigger pieces of what it means to truly shift power, be actively anti-racist and, and engage in, in decolonization. And, you know, those issues are very much cross-cutting um, across all, of, uh, all areas of our work that we do within the sector, um, within the global sector, within our organizations, within our own lives. Those issues about colonialism, oppression, intersectionality, racism, inequity showing up in and around our work. And we need to start with acknowledging them, which has started. And we need to move to unpicking some of that uh, certainty that perhaps we had before of our sector, of the way it works, of the reason that we do things the way we do, the reason that things are the way that they are. 
and we are hopefully going to be able to share some actions that each of us as individuals can take as organizations and and as a sector earlier today i was thinking about joy in this work and it certainly is tiring um, to continuously be discussing and reminding those who hold power in this sector of the need for an anti-racist intersectional lens. And it's not always joyful, but it's necessary. And knowing that we can focus, uh, we can actually focus collectively on a shared vision of what we want the future to be like, a place which is equitable where we see diversity more than a tick box where we actually have people in positions of power who are black and brown who are from communities that we serve who are set up to succeed where everyone actually has something to contribute and where we recognize the um, experience uh, the expertise that we hold in the north and how we openly move to sharing that knowledge in an equitable manner but also a kind of knowledge sharing and I really hope that that comes in the future because there's lots that I, I need to still learn, continuously learn, and there's lots that I can share as well. So thinking about the future and what it could be really does bring me joy. Um, but we can't really move to the future without addressing the past and really owning that and being grounded in future positivity, hopefulness and reality so that we can actually start to address the harms of the past and the present um of colonialism of our history as a sector and so that we can move towards a more joyful sector together um so that's my that's my kind of opening done now um i'm going to move on to talking to you about the panelists so the first speaker that we'll be hearing from will be radhika govinda radhika is a senior lecturer in sociology and the director of gendered the University of Edinburgh's interdisciplinary hub in gender and sexuality studies. She has an MA in political science and a PhD and prior to joining the University of Edinburgh she held a lectureship in gender studies at Ambedkar University Delhi in India. I'm really pleased to hear from Radhika and we'll be hearing from your perspectives on anti-racism, shifting power and decolonization. So welcome Radhika. Thanks for that um, lovely introduction, Lena. Um, and thank you to the organizers, in particular, Kat Court for inviting me. Um, let me begin by saying that I'll be speaking from the vantage point of an academic um, who teaches and researches the gender politics of development. Hopefully this perspective will complement the practitioner perspectives that other esteemed speakers on the panel shall provide. Um, I should also say that many of the students who take um, my courses at the university go on to become development practitioners. Some of them are already development practitioners interested in finding academic explanations for the conundrums that they find um, in the field of practice. So hopefully um, what I have to say will be of some interest um, to you all. Now, the brief given to me was to discuss how gender intersects with coloniality in the practices of development. But before I do this, I'd like to define what I understand by coloniality, by colonialism, and the new buzzword on the block, decolonization, or not so new buzzword now. Um, in contrast to the historically specific um, acts and periods of colonialism, in the global south, which are deemed long over, coloniality persists in our everyday life, in academe, in individual and collective understandings of self and society. For me, decolonizing is about disrupting the ways in which white bodies have established privileged relationships to indigenous lands, labor, natural resources, and what counts as knowledge itself. Avino Kesha argues, and I agree, that decolonizing is about centering the voices, the perspectives, people's movements, and scholarship from the majority world. Decolonial feminism, that is an approach that challenges the white 
Western theory and proposal of dominant feminism is part of the conceptual toolkit I try to equip myself and my students with so that every thematic session on my gender and development course, for instance, be it the session on health and reproductive rights or on education or environment is examined through this lens. I encourage the students to reflect on the coloniality of development and ethnocentrism in development knowledge production. But these are big words, big ideas. As a feminist academic of color from the global south, I've been thinking about these concerns for some years now. But just because I'm brown or from the majority world does not mean that I'm disembedded from the colonial enterprise. I too am a product of a system of knowledge that is predominantly Western. Reflexivity about one's own positionality is then really key. And this is something I try to emphasize in my interaction with my development study students. I also try to think of decolonizing as a journey, not a destination, a process, not an outcome per se. There are several blind spots, several dilemmas that I still need to interrogate, others that I'm in the process of addressing. I won't get into this, but I'll be happy to um, give an example in the Q&A if you like. Um, let me move on to um, another point um, that I'd like to make, which is that I encourage my students to employ a comparative lens for what, because of what it has to offer. It often leads to a questioning of the supposed superiority of the West, um, sort of questioning that, and of the rest playing catch up to it in terms of progressive ideas and development and sheds light on the diversity within this rest. Let me give you an example here. Uma Narayan compares and contrasts in her book, Dislocating Cultures, Identities, Traditions, and Third World Feminisms, dowry murders in India with domestic violence murders in the United States. She questions the ways in which culture is invoked in explanations of forms of violence against third world women, while it is not similarly invoked in explanations of forms of violence that affect mainstream Western women. She argues that such asymmetries in cultural explanation result in pictures of third world women as victims of their own culture in ways that are interestingly different from the way in which the victimization of mainstream Western women is understood. While Narayan invites us to compare and contrast extreme domestic violence in India and the US, I similarly invite my students to reflect on queer and trans politics in contemporary UK, India, and Uganda. On my courses, I have students from all over the world. What matters is not only the act of inclusion, but also the terms of inclusion here. My understanding of an inclusive classroom is one which recognizes that we don't leave our embodied intersectionalities at the door of the classroom. The social norms, structures and processes that differentially confer power and privilege upon individuals outside of the classroom also operate within it. In fact, that, that's the same. The same is true of the real world of development practice that my students are about to step into. Typically at gender and development conferences and NGO forums, these intersectional inequalities, not least the polarity between the global North and the global South tend to get reproduced what with sessions on theorizing being led by those from the global north, while stories from the field being led by those from the global south, what with funding being dispersed by global north actors or the privileged few within the global south leading um, development institutions and others from the global south remaining accountable to them. So I equip my students to interrogate and disrupt coloniality in development practice by asking difficult questions. Here I introduce another buzzword, intersectionality, which in its original radical form was conceived as a mechanism for understanding that gender does not exist in isolation from race, caste, class, um, age, ability, sexuality, and so on. I encourage my students to ask how and why should intersectionality matter to development people? What role do the intersecting identities that the development practitioners themselves embody play in the development interventions that they're engaged in? Does a strategic use of one identity category help unconsciously to discriminate against other identity categories? 
These are important questions that I encourage, as I said, my students to ask. And let me pause here with a plea that the onus of decolonizing development practice must be on all of us, on academics as well as activists and practitioners, on those from the global south as well as those from the global north, on white colleagues, and not just on people, especially women of color. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Radhika. Really great points there and I know you could have unpacked them a lot more. I really liked that whole uh, practice of interrogation and disruption and I wonder how far that could go in, in our sector if, if practitioners and, and us living and being in these systems actually actually had that, that space and grace to, to, to employ those, those approaches. Thank you very much Radhika. Um, we'll now move on to our next speaker. Uh, who is Danny Sri Skandaraja. So Danny has been Chief Executive of Oxfam GB since January 2019. Uh, previously, he was at Civicus um, and the Royal Commonwealth Society as well. Danny's going to be talking to us about the INGO perspective. So Danny. Thanks, Lena. And, um, and thank you to the Alliance for, for hosting this event. I think Francis, it's good to hear that your members and others are, are, are interested and engaged on these issues, because I think, Lena, as you said, for many of us working in, in international development, the last two years have been painful in many ways, but also um, inspiring and positive, because I think there is a, a, a set of conversations, a momentum, a dynamism um, that's long overdue, but that we, we sort of need to lean into. And well, as you said, Lena, I, I'm going to just share a few reflections on, on my experience here at, at Oxfam uh, Great Britain, which is um, you know, a part of a, an international confederation, a relatively large bit of, of civil society. So some of what I'm, I'm going to say might not be so relevant to, to, to smaller or other types of civil society organizations. But I just wanted to share three reflections um, uh, in, in this opening phase. One is this really is it has to be about all of us. I think um, Radhika said it and you said it, Lena, but let me say it again, you know, and, and in a really practical way. I remember starting at, at Oxfam in early 2019, and one of the first things we did was have a, we invited an external speaker to talk, to do an all-staff session uh, on, on race. It was called Let's Talk About Race, and it was facilitated by a, a, a leading UK uh, race advisory group. And um, I remember very clearly people coming to me afterwards and saying, well, what a relief it was that an international development NGO was finally talking about race in, in a sort of explicit way. I also remember white colleagues coming up to me and saying that how empowering and, and important it was to have conversations that, that involved them. And that led to a, a set of open conversations that, that involved uh, white colleagues um, uh, uh, talking about these issues. And eventually, it led to us, I think, recognizing in our case, we couldn't have separate conversations about, um, for example, equalities um, in our UK workforce and a separate conversation about how power works inside our own confederation, particularly um, how sort of northern bits of an international development NGO relate to the rest of it. And, and there's lots of other things that, that in between. And so we ended up um, in a practical way, trying to have one big conversation, which as you can imagine was, is incredibly difficult, but we found it very liberating because we knew that we would have failed if we ended up with a very good equalities policy that promoted diversity and inclusion in the UK, but failed to address the complaints heard by our partners or even colleagues in country who said, you know, they feel like they're at the end of a very long and disempowering chain in the sort of development ecosystem. Colleagues who say that, you know, money may well trickle down, but power doesn't. And so one of the approaches or a key element of our approach was to try to make sure we had a holistic conversation that joined the dots between uh, equalities, decolonization, partnership. Um, and I hope that that's useful. A second reflection for me is is that some of the assumptions that I held, and I suspect many of us hold, about how things should be are, are really based on very little. Uh, a, a, an early realization for me was that, you know, Oxfam turns 80 this year. In fact, in October, 
uh, will be our 80th anniversary. And, you know, many of us take for granted that these big NGOs must have always been like this. Well, they weren't, at least in the case of Oxfam. You know, the amazing thing about Oxfam, or one element of it, is we were founded by volunteers. <coughs> and for, you know, almost two decades, we were an entirely volunteer-based organisation, founded and headquartered in, or, you know, the, the centre of or action in, in Oxford, with no staff and, in fact, no programmes anywhere in the world. We raised resources and handed them over to local partners in parts of the world where there was famine or, or hunger, and we campaigned for policy change in the UK. And it was only really in, from the 1960s onwards as we started to sort of formalize overseas development assistance when we, like many other international NGOs, started to set up offices in the global south and, and, and became more global entities. And, you know, for good reason, we, we professionalized, we bureaucratized, we systematized what we did. And, but it does almost feel like we need to go back to the future. We need to rethink the sort of architecture that we've built up in the, in the aid system, which as Radhika says, is almost sort of a, a relic of a different era. And, and we, I think, have to lean into that question and say, well, you know, in our case, it might be going back to the future and, and, and nurturing some, uh, some, um, some bits of our history that, um, that, that might be better fit for purpose. But for each of us in different bits of the aid system, I think there is an obligation on us to, to challenge the assumptions we make about how systems have to work, how accountability needs to work, how budgets need to be reported, and, and a whole range of other, other artifacts, if you will, um, that, that we need to question. And my third and final reflection is, um, if we do that, if we do that well, if we have a holistic conversation, if we question some of those assumptions and slay some of those sacred cows, then to me, the ultimate realization is, this is the key to making a more effective civil society. You know, we live in an era of human history where, you know, states are failing us, markets are failing us. And we, those of us in civil society, particularly those of us who care about internationalism and solidarity, I think have a particular responsibility to come up with bold solutions. And that includes formations, institutions, networks, movements that are representative and, and decolonized and fit for future purpose. Because we sort of have to lead by example and civil society at its best has been about testing new things, skirting controversy. Um, uh, and I think this is another moment where we have to lead by example. And if we do it, we'll maximize our chance of delivering a, a far more just and sustainable world in which we will drive or at least be at the vanguard of that change rather than struggling to sort of to react to to all sorts of other forces so in some ways this is a you know the france is why i'm so excited about the interest in this conversation because to me the these conversations hold the key to unlock the potential of our sector or all of our institutions if we do it well and that's you know all the more reason we need to pay careful attention thanks lena Thanks very much, Danny. Um, really great points there. I've written, yeah, took lots of notes from what you were speaking about, um, how things are uh, based on very little. And I think building on that in the way that the system is at the moment, sometimes we forget, we think about shifting power out there and actually forget that, that we have responsibility as INGOs, as individuals working in the sector, we have power to change things. Um, it's not just something that happens out there. Um, and really connecting those two conversations about the discussions going on in the North and what it means for working in partnership with communities around the world. Um, it opens up a more complex conversation, something which I don't think we should be shying away from at all. And, and it's an opportunity for us to get ahead of these. Thank you very much, Danny. Um, and our final speaker is Hermimu Masudi who is a communications professional, policy analyst, and a social mobilizer based in Uganda. So he's been designing and implementing social justice campaigns for development and humanitarian actors across Africa and beyond. And currently, Hamimu is the policy and campaign officer at Health Poverty Action and co-chair of Track Changing subgroup of the Kampala Initiative. Welcome, Hamimu. All right, thanks a lot, Lena, for that introduction. I feel very honored to be speaking to members today of this network. 
but also to be a part of uh, of this panel that is discussing this uh, important conversation. I am going to be a little bit different from the uh, earlier presenters. I carried with me a presentation, so bear with me. I'm going to interrupt your your views, but uh, I I am going to discuss um, a few things building on what um, Radhika and uh, Danny have brought out very clearly. I picked up uh, a very important quote from, uh, from Danny that uh, money can trickle down, but power doesn't. That was very powerful. Um, one minute. Yes, so I just want to answer this question, two or three questions for my presentation. But the first one is, why is it necessary to decolonize? Well, there are very many reasons, but I'm going to focus on, on these uh, three. One of them is that there's persistent global poverty. Wherever you go, you're faced with poverty. Even on the doorstep of some of the most industrialized countries, we're having very many uh, people out there who cannot um, you know, find what to eat, but also are living in the situations of, of poverty. More so groups like migrant communities, but also from within the, the native themselves. The second reason why we need to decolonize is that there are deep social and economic inequalities. Wherever you go, between women and men, between races, between regions, the global north, the global south, within countries, there are very many uh, inequalities. Some of them are brought about by unfair, rather you can see them through unfair financial relationships between let's say the global north and the global south or between men and women. I'll show one slide later, but we can also uh, see them through unfair trade, climate and drug policies. With unfair trade, I think the trips, um, the current situation we are having with COVID and how to access vaccines ex says a lot about it. Where we're having some countries having more jobs, third jobs or fourth jobs, while other, other you know, people in other countries are struggling to find that first job or the second job. Same thing with climate policies. Countries, poor countries in, in, in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America, who have nothing, they've not contributed to global change, but they're suffering the effects of global change, the droughts, the floods. Meanwhile, the ones who are responsible for this are not even paying taxes. They're being let free. They're doing all things they want to do. The third bit is about the need for a framework for global solidarity. That's why we need to decolonize. We need this framework on how we should move forward, how we should live together. This is the photo, rather the image that I wanted to share with you, but it captures some of the discrepancies, the inequalities, the injustices that we are having at the moment that requires us to decolonize. So the rest of the world extracts six times the resources from countries in Africa than that which is being given through the so-called aid. Okay, so maybe someone in the global north sits and, and thinks that, and imagine that they're helping someone outside in Africa. But if you look at this statistic, it really doesn't show that you are helping this poor person, someone who's living in poverty. It's the reverse. There is a lot that is coming out, out of an ethical means. The malpractices of, uh, you know, in multilateral corporations, international corporations, the trickle-down policies, and very many things. They are just taking away wealth from people and subject them to poverty and inequality situations. And then what we have is a few aid that comes in to somehow give an impression that you help, that someone is helping. But yeah, this is the framework. This is the situation that we are currently operating in that needs to change. And that needs can be done by applying some of these principles of decolonization. 
What are we decolonizing? I won't say much about this, but I think uh, Dan brought that very well on what Oxfam is already doing. But I think um, what we need to decolonize are global policies, institutions, and also the relationships between countries. At the moment, the policies are unfair. When you're talking about the trade policies, most of them are biased. They are uh, extractive. They're taking away wealth from poor countries. When you talk about institutions, most of them, the way they are situated, the way they are structured, they are meant to serve the interest of a few, not those that actually need it most. Then we also need, well, 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 we also need to, um, to decolonize humanitarianism. I think the best case is the Haitian earthquake of, I think, the early 2000s where we had all the money going in and all the institutions from the global north following the money. And no one is asking what Haitian people want, but they're just offering them everything. So there's a lot that needs to be done around humanitarianism. Then we have program designs, the way they are programmed. I think they have uh, Western values being imposed on the rest of the world. How we go about things, we are devaluing some of the you know, indigenous you know, solutions and uh, which is not helpful and which is subjecting people to situations of poverty. Then the donor institutions, the way they are uh, churning out the support, they design for us, people in the global south, the problem statements, and then they also design for us interventions. That's patronizing, that should stop. Then the way, for, the way fundraising drives are being conducted. No one is saying, is telling people about the root causes of of poor health, of poverty and inequalities. All they are saying is increase aid, increase aid, increase the giving, you know? I think there is an, a problem there. There's a lot of lies being told that needs to be to change. Then the language, very patronizing language, the charity language, the aid language is not right. The capacity building, the expatriates, people who are coming down the field people, then the expatriate people. And the, some of this language needs to be decolonized. So how can we reimagine global solidarity? So probably we need to move away from talking about poverty, tackling poverty to tackling inequalities. I think Danny brought that very well. We need to politicize development, international development. People are not poor because they were born like that. They are poor because of social determinants. There are certain structural causes and those that have historical connotations. Then we need to move from aiding people to distributing wealth, okay? There's a lot of wealth out there that needs to be distributed. So we need to start discussing, having conversations around that. Then we need to tell a fresh story, the story of poverty, poor health, and inequality. So we need, for example, to rename departments for international development. The way they are structured at the moment, they are structured around helping out people out there and they are somehow masking the root causes of poverty and uh, of course most of the states that have these departments are responsible for some of those situations that are holding people in poverty so we need to restructure this we should stop calling it international development we can call it something else like global redistribution uh, departments or stuff like that along those lines, then the mandate needs to change. We need to stop fighting poverty, ending poverty. We need to you know, look at things like ending inequalities, or eliminating inequalities. That could be probably a most empowering uh, mandate. Then we need to bring into our campaigns work a perspective of structural inequalities, such as historical uh, legacies, and the current injustices in trade, and uh, also the debt conditionalities. I thank you very much. I'll end my session here and uh, look forward to uh, a conversation, a discussion after this. Thank you. Over to you, Lena. Thank you very much, Hamimu. Um, you covered so much in that presentation. Uh, I really, really enjoyed that. Um, so many different parts which speak to how cross-cutting the idea of decolonization is and how it touches every single every single part of our organizations of our work of our functions that we have 
in organizations. And the one point I want to bring up is, uh, is just to highlight what you talked about, which is the root causes of poverty. You really hit the nail on the head when you discussed um, actually what, what caused people and, and communities to be marginalized. Um, and to be in poverty and, you know, no access. And, and what is our role in all of that? And I think for me, that's one of the biggest pieces, especially uh, being in the UK and, and owning that history rather than ignoring it and shying it away into a corner, <laughs> corner of the room um, in darkness. I can see that we have some questions that have come in. And so I'm, I will ask this one from... Natasha, how can we bring these key points and actions to our own organizations and enact them on a small scale? And I suppose I might just add on what I was going to ask all of the speakers. So we've talked about kind of decolonization um, from the academic perspective, uh, INGOs um, and civil society organizations. Um, what light spots do you see? Uh, what things are shifting? Where is there movement across academia, INGO, civil society um, that could actually move us towards the change that we want to see across shifting power, anti-racism and decolonization? And I'm not expecting the world, uh, but maybe you're going to surprise me. What are the light spots? What are the things that you have started to see shift? Um, and I'm going to come to Hamimu first. Thanks a lot for that question, Natasha, and also for, uh, for, for that uh, follow-up, Alena. I think what we, we need to do is uh, a lot, and it alludes to what uh, Radhika talked about, that uh, this is a job for everyone. Uh, it's not for just an individual, a department, or, or probably just an institution, but it is for all of us to, to handle it. One caveat I need to put across is that every time we discuss the issue of decolonization, people always say that who is supposed to lead? Who is the legitimate leader here? And the one, the, sometimes they say should be people with lived experiences. I agree with that position that it is very important that people with lived experiences uh, have a, a, you know, a central say in how to decolonize. But I also want to add another uh, argument uh, which we discuss here in Kampala Initiative, that um, uh, we do not want to ask a question of uh, that we shouldn't be talking about who is legitimate to lead, but we should be asking what is legitimate for me where you stand. It's not about who should who has the legitimacy to lead? No, it is about what is legitimate, what is legitimate for me, where I stand as an individual, as an institution. What is legitimate for me to do to decolonize? I think that is the starting point. And we talk about issues of privilege at individual level. How are you using your privilege as an individual to decolonize? Most of others are using it to actually disempower, but you can use it to decolonize, to shield people, to support people, to protect them, not in a patronizing way, but in a manner that enables people to, to take the center stage and use their voice to empower themselves. At the institutional level, it's the same thing. Have you looked at your strategy, your five-year strategy? What is in there? What is the language inside that strategy? Okay, most of it has, still has that language or patronizing language of going to the South to give them help, to aid them, to get them out of poverty. Excuse me, who brought that poverty? You belong to a state, a government that is responsible for extracting wealth from the global South. Ask your government to do something about it. In recently, uh, the DFID, the, the, the UK government has been, you know, cutting aid. What have you done? What have you used your power as a voter in England or wherever you are in Scotland? What, how have you used your power to challenge that government position? That that money that you're cutting down is leading to mothers dying while giving birth. 
is leading to problems. It is causing inequalities. It is not helping us to decolonize. That is at an individual level. You can still engage with institutions, but still within your own institutions as an INGO, there's a lot you can do. One of them is to you know, streamline your language. That is one. Then do the auditing. Audit your, your processes, your operations. How are you going? How are you dealing with communities in the global south? Are you giving them center stage so that they can lead in the processes of eliminating poverty or eliminating inequalities? Or you're going down and asking and telling them what to do? Just the way things were done with the Haitian people, the example that I gave after the, the earthquake. What are you doing as an institution? How are our operations? Are they sipping from the histories of colonialism that are still embedded in the policies, the structures, and the systems that are still ongoing? I can't give a specific answer, but I'll just give those broad views just to help us think of solutions on our own. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Really, really heard. Um, and what came to mind was democracy and participation, actually connecting all of those different levels, as you talked about, Hamimi, um, institutional, individual. And for me, decolonizing certainly isn't about um, just the sector, it's about society as a whole and a global society, I think. Uh, Radhika, it'd be great to come to you and hear your thoughts on that. Muted. Sorry, I was just uh, furiously jotting down um, some notes based on uh, what I heard from uh, Hamimu and also the question that you'd raised right now. Thanks very much for that question. Um, I suppose, like you said about um, the development uh, sector in your opening note, um, the conversations have definitely begun. And um, it's great to see that, um, that, that the issues are being acknowledged but acknowledgement, as we know, by itself is not enough. Um, and which is where sometimes I think um, higher education institutions falter in thinking that acknowledgement is, um, is actually the achievement of decolonizing, of um, addressing, of bringing in anti-racist um, um, policies and structures. And I think that that needs to be addressed and that needs to be addressed at multiple levels. Um, you know, um, I mean, when you talked about uh, strategic plans, yeah, our universities are great at making strategic plans, okay, but um, strategic plans and, and, and these plans get revised as well every five years, every 10 years, but what happens in the middle, what was actually achieved, and perhaps the, 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 the parameters, the, the, for assessing, so for measuring how changes happen need to actually change. We need to think um, critically about that. I want to give a small example. So, you know, we, we've, um, uh, our university, but our university is not alone in doing this. Um, number of universities give scholarships to students from, coming from the Global South, especially on um, development studies programs. Um, but, that in itself, again, is not enough, because we, if you're really thinking about decolonizing the development curriculum, the development studies curriculum, which is going to train our future development practitioners in different parts of the world, um, we also have to ask when students come from Africa, when my students come from Latin America, when my students come from South Asia, when my students come from Southeast Asia, and so on, uh, from the majority world, um, how included do they feel in my classroom? Have my assessment, uh, has my assessment pattern and criteria changed? Um, if they have still to write essays, so focus on writing and in which language? English. Do they really feel comfortable with that? If we're talking about decolonizing and decolonizing language, um, including development language, which they will employ, yeah, then we need to be asking these questions in the way that development practitioners are being trained, whether in university classrooms or outside of it. Um, so that was, um, that was a, a third point. The, the last point that I'll make here is actually about, um, it connects with something that Hamimu said about, you know, it's important to ask who leads. 
um, these initiatives. But it's also important to ask where, you know, whether the labor of those who are leading is recognized or not. Often, especially in university context, when we're talking about um, teaching of gender and development and so on, and also decolonizing efforts more broadly, um, it is people of color from the Global South, it is especially women of color who are leading this work because we don't have a choice. If you want to include yourself in the classroom, um, you have to talk about coloniality in a sense. But when you're doing that, well, that work is something that one has to do. But is that work recognized? Is that labor, that invisible labor acknowledged? I think those are important questions to ask as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Radhika. Well, that just spoke straight to my heart. Um, that point on just, yeah, are we, and mostly women of colour who are leading these conversations, being set up for success or not? And are we being invested in? And yeah, all of those things are so important, I think, speaks to the values of organisations as well, recognising that in order to achieve our goals and our vision of what we want the sector to be, we need to tackle these issues. Thank you so much. Danny. Um, so a few practical things. I think on the question of diversity, I think the, the charity sector, particularly in the UK, I think has been has lagged behind other sectors. I mean, you know, the business world has been talking about diversity on its boards and leadership for um, in more powerful ways than um, and more effective ways than we have. But I think the penny is starting to drop and we're seeing now organisations being held to account. And Lena, you've been involved with Charity So White, which has been very useful at driving through some of these changes. But it's about, you know, if, you're, if we're focusing on the practical, one of the things that's made a difference for us is we set out an ambition at Oxfam GB that our leadership teams um, would be representative in gender and, and ethnic terms of the rest of the staff. Because like most charities, we had two thirds of our staff for women and about 15% of our staff were of color, but our leadership teams were nowhere near on either of those. And we set out the fact, uh, an ambition to match that. And we have now just about hit, I think, this year. Um, so we've diversified that. That's a small step, but it's a practical small step that, um, that was really important. A second one is around a, an Indian activist once said to me that the problem with NGOs is you're obsessed with accounts ability, not accountability. You're very good at preparing accounts and budgeting and log frames, you know, or, or log frameitis, as some of us call it, the sort of obsession with, with these systems. And the problem is, if you that leads to this very sort of counterproductive, distrusting system, which replicates a sort of coloniality, I think. And that we found in very practical ways that once you challenge that notion and say, actually, let's let's rethink out the forms we make out partners in the Global South fill out. Let's rethink why we only give annual grants to Southern partner organizations when we as Oxfam GB often receive long-term unrestricted um, funding. And so we've started to question this notion of how we report our accountability, including our accountability to the people we serve or claim to serve or work with. And I think that's been important. And finally, um, the, the, the thing that, sort of makes me hopeful, and it sounds strange for me to say that in the midst of a global pandemic and a climate crisis, is an Australian Aboriginal activist, Lilla Watson said in the 1970s, that if you have come to help me, you're wasting your time. But if you are here because your liberation is tied up with my liberation, then let's work together. And I do think we're at another point in human history where you know, a, a, a pandemic, a crisis of, of inequality, the climate crisis links us all together. And so if you're basing your social action or your or your collective action on some weird, outdated, paternalistic notion of, 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 of charitable help, then it doesn't, it's not fit for purpose for what we need. And we therefore need, you know, interventions that are based on mutuality, on solidarity. And, you know, I, this is a, I hope, I, pro I presume a largely Scottish audience, but when I sat at COP last year in Glasgow and heard the Scottish First Minister, you know, become the first government in the world to put money into a loss and damage fund because the principle of, 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 of responsibility, of shared responsibility um, around climate breakdown was really inspiring for me because it went beyond this idea of Band-Aid or of, of aid 
and into a, a sort of very different frame uh, around reparations, around justice, around um, around mutual liberation. And as a small sign that I think we are starting to make inroads, maybe a big sign that Scotland needs to play a leadership role on, on, on some of this. Thanks. Thanks so much, Danny. Um, yeah, I concur with that. In terms of Scotland's leadership on this, it'd be wonderful to see. And I think that's also recognising the power that you hold as, a, as an institution as well. Um, Danny, I love that quote. Um, and it really does bring it back to rooting this in we need to recognize lived experience and those people who do lead this work, create the space for them and be in that struggle with them and be in those conversations with them. And we all have a role to play, no matter your gender or your race. Um, I just want to ask very quickly then, and I know that kind of Danny, you've answered this question, but if you want to uh, add anything else, you can. Very quickly to each of the panelists, what does bring you hope in this work? One thing that brings you hope. So Radhika, come to you. What brings me hope is that um, is that my students are, um, and this wasn't the case about um, in 2012 when I um, moved to the UK and I moved uh, to Scotland and started teaching at this university. It wasn't the case, but I think today there is a certain openness, willingness, and um, real uh, genuine interest that my students have in uh, my development study students have in pushing for decolonizing, whether it is the curriculum or it is the work that they will end up doing in the development sector. And I think when the students demand this, the university has to listen and it has to respond. Um, so that gives me hope. Thank you so much. Um, great for the next generations as well. Hamimi. Yes, that's an interesting one. <clears throat> what gives me hope eh, is uh, <clears throat> what is happening around us. I think people are acknowledging that uh, <clears throat> there are, are uh, inequalities eh, and that these are man-made, if I can use that word, human-made, okay? and that can be eliminated by actions of human beings. I think that is not to be the case. And we are seeing this uh, through actions of some actors within the sector. <clears throat> More so after what happened in America during the Black Lives Matter. So we're having organizations that are doing racial you know, evaluation of their programs, of their institutions. I've participated in several of them. And uh, they are trying to change things. They're trying to look at that deep culture, that that is affecting how operations are done, even if the policies say uh, differently, even if the policies are okay. So that is giving me a lot of hope. But also where I operate besides health poverty operation, the Kampala Initiative, we have started to confront the issue of language. We think that the aid language is disempowering. It is masking the root causes of inequalities, the colonial legacies. And we have started to discussing alternative names to aid. We are saying it's not aid, we can call it something else, maybe global redistribution, maybe reparations, maybe something new. So that's giving me hope. Thank you. Danny, did you are you happy with your happy with your submission? <laughs> oh, well, I've got I've got another one if you want. It was an, it's, it's an email in front of me. At, at, received at ten seventeen this morning from a supporter of ours. Um, so one of the things we've been piloting at Oxfam GB is is a, is a women's rights fund, a community fund in a couple of countries where we work, where we've made a pledge to our partner organisations, women's rights organisation, that instead of making them fill out forms for annual grants, we'll give them three year core completely unrestricted funding. And it's a, it's a risk in some, it's a rather obvious thing to do, you'd think, but it's a risk because of the way, and I know there are lots of questions about how we measure success and show impact, but many of us have, have bought this idea that somehow we have to, you know, show every penny spent in every way and, and, and you know, build these systems on distrust. So we've said, well, let's invert it and identify long-term partners we want to support and give them resources to pay for whatever they think is the priority. And one of the reasons we were scared is because we didn't think our supporters would come on that journey with us because we thought maybe our supporters 
you know, really want to see these sort of strict systems of, uh, of, of so-called accountability. And instead, we've got this women's rights movement supported by some um, lots of Oxfam supporters. I got an email this morning saying, this is precisely the sort of initi initiative I want to support through Oxfam. Trust is in severe short supply in the world, but without it, we might as well all give up and go home. And I think that's, you know, what gives me hope that there is, you know, even amongst our supporters, interest in supporting a much more diverse, resilient, independent civil society in which power is shared, um, in which resources are shared. And I think um, we just have to take some, you know, what might be risky uh, moves, but I think in the long term, um, we will emerge much stronger and more effective. Thank you so much. Um, risky, necessary, yes just different ways of doing things. Um, and that's the excitement for all of us to take away. Um, I know that there have been many um, interesting questions that have been posed to us in the Q&A. Thank you very much for, for asking those questions. And I would really encourage you all to join the breakout groups, which we're going to go into at 10 past three. Uh, we'll be having three breakout groups um, discussing shifting power. Um, anti-racism practice and decolonization and I think that the link is in the chat for you there um, so please do bring your questions into those we will be uh, facilitating some of those so Hamimu um, and two other facilitators will be joining us there but I am aware that we have a break in two minutes so I would just like to thank all of our speakers I know this is a topic that we could really talk for a long time on um, and thank you so much for the engagement and the interest in coming to this session. It really is one that we need to keep the momentum up on. Uh, we have started, we have not finished, we may never finish but we need to come together um, no matter where we are situated in the world and really reckon with some of those really deep deep embedded issues um, like colonialism, like our own positionality to power like racial equity and gender equity in order for us to get to a better future and I think a one that definitely will be uh, leading on all of our expertise and all of the the skills that we can share together in a collaborative way so it's really exciting to to be part of this conversation to hear these incredible speakers thank you so much Amimu, Radhika and Danny. Mm -hmm.